Thank you very much, uh, Evgeny, for uh, for inviting us to kind of to present the paper. It's re it's a really an exciting program, and I'm happy to be here. And also, thanks to uh, Carol for taking the time to to discuss. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Alexei Rubtsov from Ryerson University and, and Dongwa Shin from from UNC. And Dongwa is also in the in the audience today. And it goes back to a, a very very old question that we're trying to kind of address here, uh, which is uh, close to my heart in 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 the research on on, on derivatives. Uh, and that kind of was a fundamental question that was, was often asked in the 70s and the 80s when, when we had a kind of a, a, a big introduction of, of many of derivatives products. And so in particular, we, we asking the question, so what happens to the characteristics of spot markets when you introduce derivatives? And um, we all know that in a frictionless market, any the introduction of a particular derivative contract should be just redundant because we can always replicate the, the contingent payoffs using the underlying asset and, 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 um, and, and the riskless bond. Now, I have at the moment that there's some impediments to the, uh, to the arbitrage activity, uh, well, then typically there might be uh, an effect on the underlying asset classes, and that impact depends largely on whether the derivative and the cash asset are complements or substitutes. And so in particular, if, if they're complements in the sense that the introduction of the derivative potentially attracts more traders because now you can do arbitrage activity uh, and so there's joint trading activity or perhaps because there is uh, just a, a hedging technology that's available, well then potentially we should see an improvement in, in the informational efficiency of the underlying asset or potentially more liquidity. But instead, if the introduction of, of the derivative asset kind of uh, introduces a migration of, of investors from the spot to the derivatives, well, then we might see actually a negative impact in the sense that there's a reduction in liquidity, a reduction in informational efficiency, and, and so forth. So in the literature, of course, there has been numerous papers written on this topic from, from different sites, and there's been an extensive debate, which I, I believe personally is still, is still not fully settled at this stage. And so we argue that the introduction of Bitcoin futures contracts back in, in December 2017 Prevents, uh, presents us with a, actually a unique, unique setting to, to revisit this debate. And um, I'm gonna try to kind of uh, uh, convince you that, that or we'll give you our, our arguments why you believe that's particularly kind of uh, unique and, and useful to, to look at this question. And we also think that that's kind of, that addressing that question is particularly important in the current regulatory setting because we have, I mean, there's, there's this, there continues to be a discussion on, on the benefits of ETFs in the Bitcoin space which obviously have, uh, which I consider to be a close cousin to derivative contracts, but also there's kind of a tremendous growth in, in crypto derivatives in the unregulated markets. And so whether we should kind of allow these or regulate this depends obviously a lot on, on, on how that introduction potentially affects the underlying asset classes. So um, what I'm trying to do now is kind of walk you through the arguments why we think this is unique. I'm gonna give you some motivating evidence and then walk you through the analysis. So let's start with why we think it's unique. So first of all, I think there's there's no one in this in this audience that I need to convince that the infrastructure and the trading venues here of Bitcoin are, are particularly unique. Now, specifically, we have identical assets that trade on multiple decentralized exchanges. So if you take, for example, the Bitcoin dollar, well, then we all know that you can trade the Bitcoin dollar on various kind of platforms. Let's just say Bitstamp, Gatecoin, or Kraken, and that very very importantly that Bitcoin dollar you trade on Bitstamp is literally identical to the one that you trade on Gatecoin, right? So these assets are in particular fully fungible. And again, they trade on across multiple exchanges. Now this full fungibility is actually quite important because even if you go kind of to the international finance literature or so forth or dual listed stocks, so that particular feature of full fungibility is something that is extremely difficult to come by, to come by even kind of in, in very, very closely related markets, let, let's say, for example, like uh, American depository receipts. So that's kind of the first particular point. So again, uh, fully fungible assets traded across multiple exchanges. But the second important point is that when the futures contract on Bitcoin was introduced back in 2017 by the CME and the CBOE, well, there was kind of a selective introduction in particular on the Bitcoin dollar but not effectively on any other of the Bitcoin fiat exchange rates, All right? So I think that's kind of very important because that particular introduction allows us to essentially look at the, how the characteristics of the Bitcoin dollar changed relative to those to Bitcoin Euro, Bitcoin Japanese Yen or so forth, 
importantly, in our most specific specification within each exchange. So what does that mean? Well, that effectively means that we can control for any time varying kind of characteristics of a particular exchange, let's say time varying kind of technology or improvement in technology, attractiveness of a particular exchange or counterparty risk and so forth. And we can literally focus on within exchange how the characteristics of Bitcoin dollar change relative to the Bitcoin euro. So that's a, a particularly important feature. Another one I think that we, that we do think is important is that this event was largely unanticipated. And so kind of to motivate this here, I'm just showing you a, a graph where we look at the Google search intensity for the word Bitcoin futures in the run up to the first dashed line here, which was the announcement of the contract by the um, CME back in, on the 31st of October, 2017. And then up to the second uh, red dashed line, which is the actual introduction or the first introduction of the contract by the CBOE, uh, uh, which kind of front ran the CME on December 10th. So what you largely see is effectively that there's hardly any kind of search activity on Bitcoin futures up to about kind of the, the, the first announcement of, of this contract. And then there's a big spike. And then of course, kind of it comes down, but of, of course at a slightly higher level than before. Now there's also anecdotal evidence that we have that uh, kind of basically I was at a conference uh, back in, in July in, in, in Chicago, uh, where there was the keynote speech by the chief economist of the CME where I publicly asked whether they would actually consider the introduction of such contracts. And that was effectively publicly denied that they kind of would not consider this. And so I think that's of course just anecdotal evidence, but I think also supports that. Now, even if it was anticipated, I think what's particularly nice again in this, in this particular framework is that some specificities of the cryptocurrency market actually help us to kind of think more specifically through some, some channels and also perhaps help us to rule out to kind of to, to some channels that potentially could lead to, to, to the uh, particular outcome that we find. So again, thinking about kind of Edan's work just now um, on, on, on mining concentration or, or, or Will's kind of work on endogenous adoption typically kind of uh, makes us think that if we anticipate a greater potential adoption of the Bitcoin dollar, we would expect potentially greater volatility of the underlying asset class. But again, here, we'll, I'll show you, we'll find opposite results, which kind of is, is helpful in potentially disentangling between various channels. All right, so to give you, these are kind of the, the reasons why overall we think that is a unique setting and kind of that allows us to now explore both across and within exchange variation to identify more precisely the impact of the futures introduction on the underlying spot markets. Now to give you the motivating, uh, like some, some evidence, what I'm showing you here is just for the Bitcoin dollar, um, the pairwise uh, price correlation um, across a set of five exchanges that is a subsample of the one that we have. So for example, if you take Bitfinex and Coinbase, we see that in the pre-announcement period, the price correlation was about 94%. Now, post-introduction of the futures contract, what you see is that that price correlation jumps from 94% to 99%, right? Which is, is a five percentage point improvement, which is large, obviously the frictionless benchmark, which should tell us that they should be exactly equal to one. Now, of course, you see heterogeneity across pair, uh, pairs of exchanges. Now, importantly, if I take the average across all these pairs correlation, I, can, tr I can, can, can track the average kind of correlation uh, or price synchronicity across exchanges for the Bitcoin dollar over time. If I do the same for all the other uh, Bitcoin fiat currency pairs, and then I look at the difference, when I can, then I can get some motivating evidence for how the price synchronicity of Bitcoin dollar behaved relative to all the other cryptocurrency pairs around the introduction of the, of the, 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 the futures contract. And that's what I'm showing you here. So effectively we see that before the announcement, right? From before the announcement to the after the announcement period, we see that there's a big improvement in the price synchronicity of Bitcoin dollar relative to all the other kind of cryptocurrency pairs which are broadly defined as BTC and versus CCY. And um, obviously this is kind of a just na the na naive kind of motivating evidence. We need some more formal regression techniques to kind of to literally identify this, but at least it's a hunch that there's, that the, that, the, that the futures introduction is associated with kind of a greater price efficiency of the Bitcoin dollar. And that's kind of more pronounced effectively for the, for the spot where the futures contract was introduced. Now, how, what do we do more specifically in the paper? So we're not looking only at price synchronicity, but we're looking at various market characteristics of Bitcoin spot markets. Uh, 
So we here we just borrow from the market microstructure literature. And like I said, we'll look at price synchronicities in different types of ways. We'll look at market efficiency measures, market quality measures, various liquidity measures, as well as volatility. Again, I think volatility isn't particularly important because it speaks to the issue of financial stability, but it's also kind of uh, a key subject in, in various theory papers in these literatures. Again, just in particular, the, the, the paper that we just saw, but also Will, Will's paper on, on endogenous adoption. So like I said, the way we run our kind of difference and, and differences tests is by looking at the impact of the futures introduction on the Bitcoin dollar relative to all the other Bitcoin currency pairs. So effectively our treatment effect will be kind of captured always by an indicator that kind of is one for the Bitcoin dollar uh, uh, um, uh, currency pairs, uh, and as well as the, the post indicator, that's one after the introduction of the futures contract. So alpha one effectively is essentially capturing our, our treatment effect. Now we include kind of uh, cryptocurrency fixed effects to kind of to control for any time invariant variation at the cryptocurrency level. The same for uh, exchange kind of time invariant exchange characteristics, as well as to any common effects that might kind of be uh, kind of introduce common kind of movement across all the cryptocurrencies. And I think the, the, the most important specification that I will show you and that also I think which, uh, which is the most robust and the most conservative one is the one where we include interaction effects of effectively uh, exchange uh, fixed effects together with kind of common time fixed effects. And so that interaction effect literally allows us to control for any kind of time varying characteristics at the exchange level. And so we can literally, like I mentioned before, exploit this within exchange variation, but we see how effectively within each exchange characteristics of Bitcoin dollar behave relative to all the other uh, um, control groups. Now, overall, we have um, 46 uh, Bitcoin fiat currency exchange pairs. That will be the basis for our, our analysis. So let me focus first on, on, on the base test for price synchronicity, again, which is kind of the, 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 the pairwise price correlation across pairs of exchanges. Now, in particular, if I kind of, if I look at my base basis to suggest that that the, that the price synchronicity effectively is kind of increasing by 12 percentage points, right? Uh, uh, due to the, or due to the kind of the introduction of the futures contract. Now, as I kind of successively include various kind of uh, different types of specifications, I think what's nice to see is that kind of the economic magnitude is kind of hardly unchanged. And so again, even just by, by understanding that the frictionless benchmark should be perfect price synchronicity, right? So that we're kind of moving closer to, 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 to one, that I think is, is just generally kind of an economically large effect, but also comparing this kind of to the standard deviation of price synchronicity across exchanges, I think that's kind of a fairly economically meaningful impact. Now, like I mentioned, the most important specification that we we'll look at is where we kind of introduce exchange pair and, and month fixed effects. Well, but for this particular measure, it's exchange pair, but for measures like liquidity, it's, it's literally the exchange fixed effect. Now here we still see that we get a very kind of high significance statistically, economically the effect is reduced by about a half, but five percentage points are, I still think is, is still kind of a very economically meaningful measure. The rest is just different subsamples again and regardless of how we specify this, these results go through. And so there are similar results that we get for the measure of integration. So then if you kind of run a more flexible difference in different specifications where we kind of try to kind of capture the dynamic effects of the, of, of the, of the treatment, well, then we see that in particular, we find uh, uh, no statistically significant impact in the pre-announcement period. Again, at, at least suggesting that kind of the, the parallel trends assumption is respected. But then in the post kind of period, we kind of see that, that there's kind of a persistent kind of a positive effect or persistent kind of a, a slowly increasing improvement in the price synchronicity of Bitcoin dollar, again, relative to the other uh, control groups. We then go on, so without kind of giving you too much of, of the individual kind of tables, but like I said, we repeat these tests for measures of price volatility, of market quality, of price efficiency, as well as liquidity. And uh, across the spectrum, we pretty much find, find very robust results that in particular, we find improvements of these various measures in terms of better price efficiency, uh, higher liquidity and so forth. And again, always kind of measured in terms of the, the relative improvement of the Bitcoin dollar relative to kind of the other Bitcoin uh, fiat exchange rate pairs. And generally speaking, the magnitude is, is, is also always economically significant ranging roughly between 10 and 50% of, of the standard deviation of these measures uh, uh, in the sun. 
Now, then we try to think a little bit more specifically about the economic me mechanisms. And I think one reason why potentially these prices are not uh, perfectly aligned uh, um, before the introduction of the futures contract is that it is particularly challenging to exploit any price discrepancies um, if you have to trade basically both uh, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin fear currencies uh, together with um, pure fiat currencies on the exchanges, right? And also in particular, if you have to kind of arbitrage across exchanges, well, just the fact of being able to kind of to, or like of having to kind of send money from one exchange to the other is going to take time to kind of to transfer money from one wallet to the other and so forth. Generally speaking, there are kind of a, are, are, are fairly strong restrictions in place, both geographic, but also uh, exchange specific. That, 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 that naturally kind of prevent uh, a, a perfect price alignment in, in these markets. Now, to kind of to, to look at that kind of mechanism a little bit more closely, what then quickly comes to mind is that, well, in principle, you should, you should find no treatment effect if you actually look at any possible arbitrage trade that you can operate within a particular exchange where you do not need to involve any fiat lag that is outside a particular exchange. And so more specifically, what we mean here is that, well, if you look at the Bitcoin dollar relative to the Bitcoin either, right, rather than the Bitcoin either, a uh, euro, for example, well, then you quickly see that every exchange that we have in our sample is also tr uh, trading or uh, allowing you to trade the either dollar, right, to kind of look at it completing a triangular arbitrage within the exchange. And so if kind of our hypothesis of, the, of those particular frictions is correct, we should know, see no treatment effect when we compare the Bitcoin dollar relative to the Bitcoin either at the same time period within each exchange. And so I'm focusing here on, on the yellow columns, right? So kind of the other columns are basically giving us an effect across exchanges where we could still see some, some impact, but in particular within each exchange, indeed, when we compare the Bitcoin dollar versus the either dollar, we effectively find no, no significant impact. Another question that we ask is whether this is literally due to uh, the Bitcoin uh, or whether this is potentially a dollar effect given, given the large literature on the specialness of the dollar. And so again, so another thing we do is at the same time, what we look at is effectively how the either dollar behaves relative to the either, uh, uh, relative to kind of either in, in, in conjunction with all the other kind of uh, fiat currencies. And as you would expect, right, so we have particular introduction of, of, of the, the, um, the Bitcoin dollar and no either contract. And so indeed, we find absolutely no difference in these within exchange specifications, nor across exchange specifications of, of, of seeing any differential kind of uh, influence on the either dollar versus the either or various kinds. Now, then, of course, the question comes up at a later stage, there was also an introduction of a contract on either. And so what do we find there? So naturally, we would expect kind of to find also a result if our hypothesis is true, but potentially at a, at a smaller economic scale, um, because we kind of the market has already matured. And so if you run this same exercise for the introduction of Ethereum futures, where we now compare the either dollar versus either the other cryptocurrencies, well, effectively, then we again find a, a very, very economic significant effect but which is of an order of magnitude smaller than the one that we found initially for, for, for the introduction of the Bitcoin futures. Now I have about one minute left. And so we do a number of refinements here that um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna leave and potentially the discussion is gonna talk about these um, as well as kind of a, a bunch of things on the, on the channels. So let me kind of just quickly talk about two particular things, which is the next steps kind of as we are revising the paper, as well as to conclude on uh, uh, January. So first, I think the next steps to do in this paper is to, to bring in a more conceptual framework that helps us a bit better understand how these frictions impede the price alignment exactly, and also which specific frictions are there that, that potentially impede these price alignments. Now, we're also kind of thinking about external val validity of these, 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 uh, these results. Now, even though more generally, I think the, the conceptual issue that once you introduce uh, a related asset, which is a derivative asset that's kind of tied to the underlying binary arbitrage, well, this idea of complementarity versus substitutability applies actually more generally. We're also thinking kind of in particular about developing the section on channels where I didn't have time to go through, but also again, to exploit more specifically the, the heterogeneity in confirmation time across exchanges to, to really use the, the specific features of the, of the cryptocurrency market effectively to, to, to dig deeper into the economic channels that help us understand these effects. 
And then also, of course, to look at more specifically at the flows across the various exchanges that, that would help us again, pin down the exact arbitrage me mechanisms as well as trading horizons. Now, to not kind of bore you too much with, with the details, in particular, let me conclude. So effectively, we're trying to use the particular features of the crypto exchange uh, uh, markets to help us to, to shed some new light on a very old and fundamental question in, in derivatives literature. So do derivatives increase the efficiency of the spot markets? And so here we focus on the number of, of characteristics uh, that we borrow from the market microstructure literature. And so we have a very simple answer that yes, we believe they do. And, and, and we, we, we believe that our identification strategy is actually fairly robust in, in, in really trying to, to make that point. Thank you very much.